On behalf of the Royal Commission into Victoria's mental health system, can I welcome you to the Melbourne Town Hall for this really important occasion. I'm Chris Cota. I've had the, um, uh, the privilege of spending time with uh, some of you, perhaps many of you, as, uh, as our consultations earlier in the year took place. So um, I'm delighted to be here and to MC for the next while on this important milestone for the Commission. Uh, today is nearly the halfway point of the work of the Commission and, uh, and in a moment Penny will talk about the interim report that's just been released and I'm sure that you're very eager to hear about. So let me just get a couple of housekeeping matters out of the way before Penny begins. Uh, firstly, there are uh, bathrooms out the back of the room that we're in, so please be aware of those. Uh, emergency exits, if you look around, I'm not anticipating any of those, but I really do want you to know where they are. Uh, we, we have had at every one of our consultations counsellors. Given the, given the topics that we've talked about, the issues that we've covered. So uh, if I could just see where our councillors are so that if you know where they are, back of the room, just raise your hand if, um, if that's necessary somewhere on the, way th on the way through. We've got three councillors happy to assist if need be. Uh, we've also got uh, plenty of the staff from the Commission, certainly around the room and then out the back. They'll be wearing their name badges and we'd all be very happy to answer your questions or help you through the next while if we can do that. Uh, copies of the interim report, I think most people have got one of those copies and they're certainly on the Commission's website. Uh, there'll be some cameras uh, filming this particular session. Uh, they'll be filming the Commissioners only and if, there's also live tweeting going on. So uh, if you're inclined to do so, the hashtag is hashtag capital R, capital C, capital mental health and please make use of that if you'd like. So after the presentation, there'll be an opportunity for uh, a couple of questions. We've also got some light lunch that we'd like you to stay and share with us after the event. But, um, but now's the time to hand over to Penny Armitage, who's the chair of the Royal Commission into Victoria's Mental Health System. Penny will take us through the interim report, give us an idea about some of the key findings, some of the work so far, the initial recommendations, and the next steps up ahead. Thanks, Penny. Thank you very much, Chris. And on behalf of the Commission, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we, on which we meet, the people of the Kulin Nation, and to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and extend that to Elders joining us here today. My name's Penny Armitage, and I'm the Chair of the Royal Commission into Victoria's Mental Health System, and it's a privilege for me to be here today to mark the release of our interim report, which is this very big document that I think many of you will have to access by downloading it from our website. Um, but I am very pleased to be joined today by my fellow Commissioners, Professor Alan Fells, Professor Bernadette McSherry and Dr Alex Cochran. So thank you all very much for making the time to be with us, braving the tram strike and still getting here in time for our discussions this morning. I'd also like to welcome members of our expert advisory committee, including their chair, Professor Patrick McGorry. Welcome members of the committee. I'd also like to particularly acknowledge the leadership of our team at the Royal Commission, Jodie Geisler, our CEO, her executive and our other team members who I can assure you have worked incredibly tirelessly to get this interim report produced and I thank them on our behalf most emphatically for that. The quality and the analysis in the interim report, our conclusions and recommendations have been informed by contributions from stakeholders and the broader community and we see this as a truly collective effort. And we thank you all for your willingness to participate so willingly and help us to produce what we are very proud of in terms of our first of two major reports that will be produced by this commission. The very act of calling this Royal Commission is an acknowledgement that the current system is broken and beyond simple repair. It underscores the extent of society's failure to provide adequate and integrated treatment, care and support to people in Victoria living with mental illness. There is an acceptance that the community-centred outcomes promised long ago by the reforms around deinstitutionalisation have not been realised. Once admired as the most progressive in our nation, the state's mental health system has catastrophically failed to live up to expectations. 
Past ambitions have not been realised or upheld and the system is woefully unprepared for current and future mental health challenges. There is recognition that the services available do not meet the needs of those who need them most. It also speaks to the fact that mental health must become a priority for all Victorians. A fragmented and dysfunctional system is one thing, but the failure to provide appropriate treatment, care and support is a source of both damage and distress. The impacts on individuals, families, communities and our social integrity is profound and largely preventable. As one person told the Commission, the system should be considered your ally, not your enemy. Our community has allowed mental illness to remain hidden. Stigma, discrimination and prejudice persist, directed at those who live with mental illness. This has been permitted to pass almost without notice and it might also explain why we as a community have failed to demand an investment in mental health that is, least, at, is at least comparable to that in other areas of health. Today is an important milestone in the life of this Royal Commission. This interim report at more than 660 pages, it's quite a long read, I hate to say, um, is a stock take of what we have heard so far about Victoria's mental health system. It is by no means the whole story. So the interim report is not about providing all the answers or responding to everything that we have heard. Instead, the report contains a number of priority recommendations that we consider address immediate needs. Importantly, all of the recommendations lay foundations for a transformation of Victoria's mental health system over coming years. Most of the Commission's recommendations will be made in our final report, which will be delivered in October next year. The Victorian Government has already committed to implementing the Commission's recommendations. Following feedback and input from the community during our consultations, the Commission developed a set of principles to guide our work. We are encouraged by the hope and trust of those who have contributed to the Commission and their aspirations to achieve an equitable and responsive mental health system. We began with an acceptance that Victoria's mental health system needed fundamental reform. We have heard and read over the past nine months what has reinforced and amplified that view, sometimes in very painful detail. One person told us, an often repeated explanation is that the system has cracks and that people will fall through them. I don't know if we were just unlucky to continually step on those cracks or if those cracks were so wide that you cannot avoid them. Mental illness affects people from all walks of life. Victoria's mental health system should be one in which access to treatment, care and support does not discriminate one providing services that none of us would hesitate to use or have our loved ones use to seek support. The current system does not provide those living with mental health illness with what they deserve or what we as a community should demand. In making those observations, I want to pay tribute to those who work, often in difficult and demanding circumstances in the current system. They are often constrained from providing better care by factors outside of their immediate control. Neither the commitment and care of those who work in the system, nor the individual services they work for, are subject to inquiry by this Royal Commission. Because the issues are so much more and are much more deeply entrenched and are system-wide issues, not individual worker or performance issues. The woeful lack of investment in mental health has perhaps been the clearest finding of our work so far. Not only is there underinvestment, under but there has been continuous decline over recent decades. The share of funding allocated to mental health as part of the overall health budget in Victoria is disproportionate. It does not reflect the incidence of poor mental health in our community, nor does it reflect the overall burden of illness in the community in which mental illness and suicide is second only to cancer. Victoria invests heavy, heavily in physical and public health and in other service areas such as education, transport, infrastructure, corrections, but we spend less per capita than other Australian states on community-based care and inpatient beds. The time has come to get the funding of mental health services right. That is why we have recommended that the Victorian Government adopt a wholly new investment approach to mental health. 
a tax or a levy, one that will ensure a substantial and sustained increase in mental health funding for future generations. This will enable delivery of a significant reforms required to establish a contemporary and enduring mental health system. We have recommended in our report that this be a decision for government about exactly what form that tax or levy might take and also how they create an infrastructure investment fund. But clearly we believe that substantial in injection of additional new money on top of the existing allocation is required to make our system fit for purpose for the future. Money is clearly only one measure, but there is also a profound human toll that accompanies a broken system. While the cost to individuals and loved ones is great, the Commission estimates that the overall economic cost to the Victorian community of poor mental health is currently around $14.2 billion a year. Much of that cost is, is avoidable and would be reduced by investment in an effective system focused on and designed with the help of those who live with mental illness. The challenge ahead is to deliver the foundations and tools needed to rebuild Victoria's mental health system into one that can meet growing and changing demand for service for a state that is and will continue to rapidly grow and change. It will simply not be enough to renovate a system originally designed to provide services only to those with severe mental illness. As one person told the Commission, we can't keep tacking things on to an unstable system. The system is failing to deliver services for people with a, where a simple intervention could prevent escalation and the need for an emergency response. It fails to meet the needs of people who require more than primary care but who are not sick enough for acute care and treatment, where these individuals reach out for help only to find there is none. The prospects are bleak. That the system has been able, unable to grow to meet these needs is in part because of the lack of investment in mental health services. One in five Victorians experience mental illness in any given year. Every Victorian knows someone, a family member, friend, colleague, social contact, who lives with mental illness on a daily or perhaps intermittent basis. Almost 60,000 Victorias are carers for someone with a mental illness. There has been a deliberate focus by the Commission on hearing from those who understand mental illness most intimately, the individuals who live with it and the people who live with and care for them. These individuals' perspectives on the system are essential, not just to understand where it is now, but more importantly, where it must get to. Meaningful change to the system can only occur with the ongoing involvement of people with lived experience. The Commission has also heard from a broad range of others with different perspectives and often deep understandings of the system. This includes mental health professionals, consumer and carer peak bodies, academics, administrators and public servants. The views of those who currently work in the mental health system will also be significant in redefining it. We know that poor mental health in the Victorian community affects us all. The sheer volume of information that has been presented to us so far speaks to the extent to which Victorians are engaged with this issue. We have received more than 8,200 contributions from across Victoria in both formal and informal ways. It is reassuring that the concerns and aspirations expressed by people living with mental illness, their families and carers, are mirrored by the views of those who work in and have responsibility for mental health services. The experiences of how the system has failed and in some cases harmed people living with mental illness has been moving and tragic. We are indebted to those who have shown considerable courage in sharing their experiences with us, often motivated to ensure their personal experiences aren't repeated for others. Perhaps the most consistent observation we have heard from people living with mental illness, family members and carers, is how hard it is to get help when it's needed. Individuals are forced to wait, they become very unwell. Finally, and only after they si show signs of major distress of, or crisis, do they often gain access to treatment. Families and carers often find themselves left out of decision making about treatment and care. Being a carer can be challenging and its impacts can be lifelong and profound. 
the Commission has been told there is a general lack of support for families and carers. Yet we know that for many people, there is a strong prospect of recovery from mental illness. Recovery depends on personal experience and the extent to which someone has been able to obtain treatment, care and support, especially at the early stage of their illness. The whole idea of recovery and what it means in the context of mental illness and the point at which it becomes part of the care and support offered by the system will be pivotal to the Commission's ongoing work. Another focus will be on how prevention can be improved as part of our reshaped system. Far beyond responding to crises and providing clinical care, the prevention of mental illness is entwined with broader social and economic factors that affect individuals and community resilience. The idea of taking a system approach to enable people to achieve good mental health rather than just responding to mental illness appears often in the evidence before the Commission. <laughs> As part of its work, the Commission has been specifically directed to inquire in to and report on how to effectively prevent suicide. While not all suicides are directly linked to mental illness, suicide represents the ultimate failure of a mental health system. Last year, according to data gathered by the Coroner's Court of Victoria, there were 720 suicide deaths in Victoria. This was more than three times the number of people killed on our roads. 10 times as many were admitted to hospitals because of self-harm. And whilst considerable resources and sustained efforts are put into road safety campaigns and strategies to prevent these tragic losses, much more needs to be done to help prevent suicide. How to give effect to suicide prevention more broadly will remain an important focus of the Commission's work over the next year. Another common message has been that the system fails to treat people with dignity or respect. The, that very first contact for people in crisis will often come to define their whole experiences of the system. In a system that has become increasingly crisis driven, first contact is often with the police or other emergency services. The trauma of being publicly bundled into a police car or left alone in a hospital emergency world at such a time can itself cause even more harm. The broader need for trauma-informed mental health treatment, care and support is only just starting to be recognised. There is much to be done in this regard. Many told the Commission the system needs to be more responsive to trauma and that there is potential for people to be re-traumatised in the system designed to help them. Similarly, we heard a lot about the extent that stigma and discrimination towards those with mental illness persist in our community. This form of prejudice is not just merely unjust, it can act as a further barrier to people seeking help. Poverty and disadvantage present further challenges and barriers to accessing the system even at a basic level. Some, for some people, a gap payment for service is too expensive to contemplate. The Commission has heard much about the missing middle. A growing group of Victorians have forms of mental illness that are complex and enduring. They cannot be treated through primary care alone, but are not considered sick enough to receive specialist mental health services. As a result, those in the missing middle either receive insufficient care or no care at all. They fall through the gaps in the system. The system is also failing our younger people. There is a compelling case for greater investment in the mental health of younger people to prevent the impacts and consequences that could otherwise be felt across a lifetime. Evidence before the Commission suggests that 75% of all lifetime cases of anxiety, mood, impulse control and substance use disorders emerge by the age of 24. We must do everything to ensure the health and well-being of our future generations. For certain groups in our community, mental illness and the way the system deals with them provides additional challenges. They also face a range of barriers when accessing care and support. People living with mental illness along with other conditions such as poor physical health, disability or alcohol and drug misuse can have even greater difficulties gaining access to specialist services that, not, that are not currently sufficiently integrated to respond to various needs. People living in rural and regional areas are more likely to experience stigma and have difficulty accessing services. Whilst the prevalence of mental illness is the same as in the metropolitan Melbourne, suicide rates are higher in regional and rural Victoria. 
Aboriginal communities continue to endure, endure the effects of trauma caused by colonisation, dispossession and the impacts of the stolen generation. Everything we have heard will continue to inform the next steps that the Commission takes in facilitating the redesign of Victoria's mental health system. What the Commission has learned about the current system will prove critical to helping redesign it. Firstly, by avoiding the deficiencies and failings of the past, and secondly, by pointing to those areas of growing and greatest need. As I noted earlier, the Commission is making some priority recommendations in the interim report, recognising that most of our work is still to come. Along with the recommendation to substantially increase investment in mental health, the Commission is recommending the creation of a Victorian Collaborative Centre for Mental Health and Wellbeing that brings together expertise and lived experience, research and clinical and non-clinical care. The centre will serve to spread the practice of evidence-based treatment, care and support across the state. In response to specific and immediate gaps, the Commission recommends an additional 170 acute mental health beds for young people and adults in areas of need to help respond to demand. And funding all area mental health services to deliver the HOPE hospital outreach post-suicide engagement program and the creation of a new assertive follow-up service for children and young people to support those at risk of suicide. The creation of an Aboriginal social and emotional wellbeing centre and the establishment of social and emotional wellbeing teams in every ATCHO across the state. We believe that this approach, founded on a holistic understanding of people and connections, has the potential to inform new and innovative models of care for the rest of the community. The establishment of Victoria's first residential mental health service as an alternative to acute care designed and delivered by people with lived experience of mental illness. The development and implementation of supports and structures designed to enhance and expand consumer and family carer lived experience workforces in the mental health system <coughs> and increased opportunities to expand and develop the mental health workforce, including funded graduate positions, postgraduate scholarships and psychiatry rotations, supported overseas recruitment, leadership development and improved workforce data. In order to begin the transition to a redesigned mental health system, the Commission has recommended that a mental health implementation office be established to operate for two years and respond to the interim report's recommendations while the Commission designs governance arrangements for the future mental health system. At the heart of what the Commission will do in the lead up to our final report is the design of the central elements of a future mental health system. Underpinning this design is the need to create a system that is responsive, accessible and fair. It must also respect the dignity of people living with mental illness and support them to fully and effectively participate in society. The funded mental health system must also grasp the opportunities offered by human the future mental health system, sorry, must also grasp the opportunities offered by human-centered design and digital and technological transformation. There is still much work for us to do. The scale of change means that some of the benefits of this inquiry's work may only be realised in generations to come with some more immediate gap progress. There is already much interest at both the state and territory and federal levels in the extent of the problems with mental health services in Australia. There is also an encouraging level of public interest, discussion and debate in connection with mental illness. The Commission will continue to interpret and be guided by the huge amount of information we have already received. There will also be further public hearings in April and May next year. The Commission is not seeking formal submissions on the interim report. Contributions from people living with mental illness, families and carers will, however, continue to be central to the Commission's ongoing work. We will continue to involve people with lived experience in our work and the development of the Commission's final report, which will be delivered by the 31st of October 2020. The resp that report will set an ambitious blueprint for transforming Victoria's mental health system and improving the lives of people experiencing mental illness, their families and carers, and the Victorian community now and in the future. One person told the Commission, we never reimagined what services could look like. 
that is about to change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Um, we do have a short period of time, and I know that you won't have had enough time to digest the report and its implications, and there are probably lots and lots of questions that you have and more to come. Uh, there'll, be, uh, there'll be some frequently asked questions on the, on the website along with some fact sheets after today, but there might be some questions over the next little while that we can pick up on. And we've got a roving mic or two that'll come around, so let me, uh, let me, let me see if I can um, pick up any of the questions that you might have. We'd really appreciate, if it's okay with you, to let us know your name, please, before you ask the question. And I'll just look at Penny and see where we oh, can take the question. Hi, Julie Dempsey. Um, thank you so much for listening over these past months and for putting together an interim report that seems to cover a lot of what you've heard. Um, I just wanted to ask specifically the 170 beds you're recommending. Will some of that funding be dedicated to female-only wards? Um, thank you very much, Julie. We haven't specified exactly how, how those wards should be um, delivered. We have said what we want is in that 170 beds to drive innovation, not just to be more of the same. So that's why we haven't distributed them widely across the whole system. We have, in our recommendation, concentrated them through Melbourne Health for Northern and Western Health and in Barwon Health and also recommended that 35 of those beds be delivered by a private provider who would, and those beds would be for people who would otherwise be accessing public mental health services. And the reason we've done that is to try and drive some innovation in design and operations of those new units. And we've also recommended that when considering those, the responsible health services should think about whether or not they can also provide assertive outreach services, effectively hospital in the home, as a substitute for some of those beds. So another question, just at the back there. Uh, good morning. It's, my name is Maggie Toko. I'm the CEO of the MIEC. Um, I just, I'm not, I don't have a question, but I have a statement, which is that Vermeek is very encouraged by the report, the interim report, and uh, especially by uh, lived experience being uh, mentioned quite widely throughout it, um, and encouraged by the um, the thought that you've put into it around lived experience, and uh, and we look forward to um, we look forward to uh, working with the commission going forward. Thank you. Appreciate those comments. There was a gentleman just about halfway along whose hand was up. We might just take your question, sir. Uh, hello, my name's Eternity. Um, my question is, how are we going to handle uh, what's the definition for mental health in regards to driving? Because some people have their licences taken off them for mental health reasons, and that can impact like their livelihood and stuff like that, but also there's the aspect of keeping the community safe. Okay. Um, thank you, Eternity. I'm not quite sure yet in terms of how that issue would be addressed. We may have a conversation with you separately about understanding exactly what you, the issue is in terms of that. We do know that people's capacity to continue to contribute in society and lead very fulfilling lives is very often dependent on their capacity to have access to a range of services and mobility is a part of that. But I think the issue about people being able to retain their driving licence is something we can talk to you further about. Any other questions? Just, just here, thank you. Hi, Jenny Smith, uh, CEO Council of Homeless Persons. Um, congratulations on your very important work and the uh, interim report. Um, I'm just wondering if you could clarify where in the report um, we can feel reassured that um, you have got the message around the importance of housing and support underpinning um, the system, which is struggling to find it at this point. Um, thanks very much, Jenny. Um, there are some issues in the report that I know many interested people in this room will say, where is that featured? 
housing and homelessness, access to affordable, stable housing. We certainly reference that as an important issue in terms of improving outcomes and people's capacity to fully contribute in society. Um, we have, as you know, started our roundtable discussions and this is an area that we will have future focus on and much greater focus on in our final report. Do we have any other questions? We've got one just here at the front. Oh, hello, my name's Caroline and I work within um, the Migrant Resource Centre um, sector and I was just wanting to know about the cold um, communities, the migrants, refugees, but also international students and when they come here and the support that they would receive and some of the, you know, the workforce issues around that too. I know we put forward a submission, but I was just wanting, I didn't see anything within the recommendations so far. Relating um, to we, that. Certain, we certainly have been conscious of our engagement with, with culturally and linguistically diverse communities and with our refugee and other communities and I'm pleased you've raised the issue of international students because that's also come up in our consultations and discussions to date. Um, it is like many of the other areas we've just talked about. We haven't at this stage, at this point in our interim report, focused on all of the groups in the community who have particular issues that we know are impacting them and their capacity to access and get the supports that they need. They are in our letters patent, have been groups that we are continuing to engage with and as part of our deliberations about future system design, we have to contemplate what is the way in which we make sure we have culturally responsive services but also think about where there may be needs for dedicated responses, particularly, for example, in relation to trauma for our refugee populations, for example. Thank you. Let me just, make, there's a couple of people at the back, so I might get a microphone to the back of the room. I don't want to miss you. Uh, Sarah Pollock from Mind Australia. Uh, first of all, thank you for, for the work you've done in the 600 pages that I'm looking forward to reading. Um, I understand you, you're not taking further submissions and, and personally I'm really relieved. I'd be very interested to know your rationale and, and you know, just in terms of your process, what, what the thinking is behind that. Yes. Thank you. Um, when we've looked at our time frame, whilst when we started this Royal Commission in March this year, when we four commissioners added our appointment and established the office with our CEO, um, we really mapped out our timeframes, what was it going to be possible to do. And as a Royal Commission, you will see when you read this report, the robustness of us having to consider evidence to ground our findings and conclusions is more onerous in a Royal Commission. And so we have to allocate a lot of time to our deliberative analytical processes and to the preparation of our reports. So when we work back from October 2020, whilst that might seem like a long way away, for us it is not. We worked out what we had to do by when in order to have comprehensively acquitted our letters patent. And that has led us to conclude that over and above the round of submissions that we've had now, we have to focus after this interim report very much on the specific questions on our mind about design of the system. So that's why we've already started a human-centred design process. There's been consult consultations going on around the state with groups of people to help us with that process already. And between now and February, we will be doing a lot more of that type of deliberative work, continuing to consider the in excess of 3,000 submissions that we have received in relation to the individual issues that they raise and also focus on our next round of hearing topics. So it won't be that we won't continue to seek new and additional information, but we will target that request to the issues that we think we need further advice and guidance on from both our expert advisory committee, from others with whom we're engaged, and we will be using round table discussions and other mechanisms to help make sure that we have a good consideration of those issues. So it's really pragmatically we don't believe we can have another fully sub open submission process at this stage. So let me stay at the back of the room and then I'll come forward again and pick up on some last questions. So, a uh, gentleman at the back of the room. Luke Reichen here on behalf of Youth Affairs Council Victoria. On behalf of young people, thank you for everything you've done and the really strong focus on young people in the report. If I could ask for young people reading the report over the next couple of weeks and having ongoing experiences with the mental health system, what would you say to them to keep them going for the next year? 
Um, I think I'd be saying we are listening to and have heard what you have said to us about the importance of a de redesigned system and uh, means by which they can get access to care, treatment and support when they need it. Um, and certainly that they will continue to have a voice and be considered by us and the other experts with whom we engage to help design a system for children, infants, children and youth that we think is responsive to their needs. Anyone else there at the back and then we'll come up, we'll make our way forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nicole Juniper, I'm a lived experience peer worker. Uh, you mentioned the Victorian Collaborative Centre. I was uh, for people with lived experience and clinical expertise. I was wondering how and when that's going to come about. Um, this is a very ambitious part of our initiative. We have looked at other collaborative centres, both in Australia and Victoria and also overseas, and seen the important role they play. So we do see this as a physical space that brings together all of those aspects of research and clinical care with strong input from people with lived experience. And effectively, we've looked at a model of a co-director responsibility, someone with clinical expertise and leadership capability, and someone with lived experience expertise and capability to be the leadership core of this new centre. So it'll be, um, it's a bit hard to say how quickly it will get off the ground, but we are really pushing that to be a priority that really encourages the research and evidence that's needed to help ensure that we have high quality clinical and non-clinical care and support offered to people throughout the state. Let's move a little closer to the front, please. Uh, my name is uh, Raju Lakshman, uh, I'm a psychiatrist. So uh, I just want to congratulate the commission on the very comprehensive and probably very uh, community-centered uh, approach to this whole issue and I think the principles are really uh, probably capture the accurate sense of uh, what's happening. Uh, I just want to sort of get your thoughts, and I'm sure it'll be addressed in this report or in the full report, uh, around the issues around regional Victoria, because yes. I work across metropolitan and regional services, and I see that there is a great inequity in both the funding and access to services, and the models seem to be sort of not really custom uh, built to the communities that are out there uh, outside metropolitan Melbourne. So just wanted to hear your thoughts so that I can reassure myself that something's in process. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. We have um, been asked to focus on the particular needs of people in regional and rural Victoria as part of this Royal Commission and that has continued to be some of our focus. Um, and clearly what we have been told is about the tyranny of distance, but not only the tyranny of distance, some of the strengths that exist in rural communities, the willingness of people to support and assist each other, but also some of the downside in small towns and other communities where everyone knows everyone's business and some of the unique issues that might be barriers to accessing treatment. We are also very mindful of some of the workforce challenges that exist in regional and rural Victoria that need to be addressed to ensure that we have the type of system that we will need available for all Victorians. The design of how the mental health system should work in regional and rural areas is going to be the subject of ongoing consideration in our report. We were interested in the focus of the Productivity Commission recent draft report gave to this issue the place they see of telemedicine and other things in rural, Victor or rural Australia and more remote communities. And we're mindful of that and the other inputs that we'll continue to get in the course of the next months in terms of how to make sure our system's design is equally relevant for people who live in the bush and in regional areas. Thank you, and I think I've got three more people to ask some questions, so we'll start over here and then we'll come around. Hi, I'm Shelley Braverman Lichtman. Um, I know this is a state-based Royal Commission, but not being in a vacuum, um, and given the role of the NDIS now in the mental health space, um, what sort of partnerships or um, work for the future do you see that you can do with other states and national bodies, even though it's outside of the formal jurisdiction? Thank you, Shelley. And we already have been very focused on how do we make sure that we 
um, look at the Commonwealth state relationships, the funding arrangements between the Commonwealth and the state, the areas of responsibility they have as the Commonwealth is the primary funder of our primary health system and related areas. And so we've had a high level of engagement already with the Commonwealth and Commonwealth agencies in thinking about how do you ensure that there is the greater leverage across the interest of both the Commonwealth and the state in our future design of our service system and that we capitalise on the current commitment that both the Prime Minister and his Minister has given to the prevention of suicide, the leadership role that Christine Morgan is playing in her role as Special Advisor to the Prime Minister and we have engaged with Christine and are very much looking toward to working with her and also with the Productivity Commission as we see about how our work is complementary to theirs and where we can leverage off the interests of the Commonwealth and the State. I'm um, sorry, Shelley, and the other thing is we're clo obviously closely working with NDIS and have been considering the submission that they have made available to us and we will continue to work with them, understanding the impact and the important role they have about psychosocial disability and the role that they provide in terms of that ongoing support. Thank Patricia you. Robin, uh, for Chair of VIMIAC. Um, you mentioned the need for community change and attitude change. And Australia and Victoria in particular has been extremely successful over years in AIDS campaigns, drug and alcohol, community, um, community health, etc., domestic violence, in changing attitudes. I think that one of the, or we think that one of the critical issues is about community change, mm. that issue that you talked about of stigma. Um, for people with lived experience mm -hmm. and even their carers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm interested, we're interested in what that might look like. And mm -hmm. I'm sorry, it's our AGM and we have to go in a minute. <laughs> I'd love to hear that, well, that comment. Thank you very much. And I, I guess this issue of how do we change attitudes has been a very big focus of the deliberations around the Royal Commission because when we've wound back even, for example, why the level of underinvestment in mental health has been able to continue for so long without enormous upcry in the same way, outcry as you might have seen in other areas. Um, we do think that it is linked to the stigma that has been associated with mental illness and the fact that it's been a, what we describe today as a hidden crisis in our health service. And so it is something that we will be thinking further about, taking further advice on in terms of how do you um, create change in community attitudes so there's a much more positive attitude to the contribution that can be made and a willingness to accept that mental illness is an issue that affects all Victorians and we should have a shared interest in supporting people who are impacted by it. Thank you. So we're just about done with our questions. There's just one more here. Let's Hello. see if I can Hi. just pick up the last couple. So just a, just a couple of quick ones. Tara. Yeah. I'm Tara Lawas, Mental Health and AOD Manager at Eastern Melbourne PHN. <laughs> and I was wondering with the expansion that you've identified of the acute system, what kind of dovetailing that will have with primary care? Because yes. often that can be quite a disjointed um, mm. care hand over there. Mm. Um, certainly we think that the relationship between primary care and the whole of our mental health system is absolutely fundamental in terms of building a continuum of step care that we say is part of the design of a mental health system but it hasn't been given full effect to ensure both appropriate levels of intervention at the point in time people most need it but also appropriate transfers um, and transitions for people when they might have experienced more acute episodes back into their primary care system. And so we are hoping that the health services who have responsibility for the expansion of the new programs will be working creatively about how to build and leverage off that interest and shared commitment there is in thing, in, through PHN and other services in the system. Okay, last couple of questions, please. Thank you. Uh, Nina Lightala, Executive Officer of Victorian Student Representative Council. Really pleased to see that the Commission has um, identified that young people are at such great risk of mental illness. And I'm really keen to um, see what the Commission's thoughts are around the role of schools and education settings in ensuring that these young people have, um, I suppose, access to and empowerment over their own mental health, um, particularly in terms of preventative measures. Yes. 
Um, and certainly, uh, thank you for raising that issue. We are clearly looking at what is a whole of government response to mental illness. How do you engage with other mainstream elements of the service system, most particularly education, but not beyond that as well, in our redesign system? Because we really have a very strong voice there through the education system and an opportunity to provide assistance to vulnerable young people that we need to make sure we're maximising. That has been the subject of considerable discussion already, has been the focus of much of the recommendations of the Productivity Commission and is something that we will continue to look at in terms of our system design for the future. Okay, and I think I'll just take one more final question about halfway at the back there. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much, and I'm really looking forward to reading the document. I was wondering if there had been reference to issues papers potentially being published, and I'm wondering if you're still contemplating that, because mm. you've identified a number of key issues where you're seeking further advice, yes. and there are other ones that have come up like combating stigma, yes. which would seem to me to be appropriate. So, yeah, that's a comment and a... Yes, and, thank and you. And it's actually a question. Um, thank you. I mean, the, our work program for the next period, clearly you will have seen that focused on producing our interim report, our obligation to have this report tabled in Parliament today was um, obviously driving a lot of our work program now. But we have got our work program being sorted now for the remaining period of the Royal Commission. And we're yet to finally decide whether we would put out issues papers on any specific issues. But we're clear that it would be one mechanism, so to our broader roundtable and other discussion processes that we're having. And so we haven't committed yet to how we might engage appropriately on some of those specific topics, but we hear your interest. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I wish I could offer you a lot more time this afternoon, but I'm really grateful to the commissioners for the presentation and for taking those questions. Uh, I want to um, just thank you personally, because I've worked with three royal commissions, and I know that they get their energy from people who care enough to be here. So thank you, and thank you for the important work that you do. Uh, take back our thanks to the people that you work with. We've been able to come this far only because of that amount of effort and contribution, and I really hope that it'll continue over the next month as the Commission continues to do its work. So thanks again to the Commissioners, thank you to the staff of the Royal Commission Office and for all of their supporters, and I hope that you'll stay with us for a little lunch at the back of the room. Thank you again for being here today. <laughs> Thank you.